Okay, I think it's time to start. Let me introduce, welcome our guest, Professor Juan Houghton from Michigan Delta College, US. And he is a full writer here for this semester. So some of, some of you already met him. He was teaching a class, two classes, also gave some seminar. So today he will tell us something about the Great Lakes and environmental pollutions and stuff because he's mostly he's a hydrobiologist, mm -hmm. stream ecologist, mostly environmental scientist mm -hmm. involved with uh, environmental risk assessment and stuff like that. So this is his field. <laughs> Please. Yes, thank you, Mikhail. It's good to be here. I'm glad you guys are here. Welcome, welcome. Let's tell your smiling faces without the masks. Um, all smiles. Yeah, all smiles. I'm sure you are. I see it in your eyes. Um, I'm going to try to, to speak slowly, like for you know the English, but I will get on a roll. And Mikel has promised that he will, you know, be too fast. The other thing that I don't mind is if you, you know, some speakers they let me finish and then we'll ask questions. I know that's kind of tradition, but if there's something really, you know, ooh, you know, could I ask you about that? Do I mean just I really don't mind. You might derail my train of thought for a second, but I really don't mind. I want to make the, the talk as general as possible and so that most people would understand it in a, in a more, more of an ecosystem, you know, wide uh, way. And one of the things that Mikhail and I were talking about, what would be a good topic, right? And Great Lakes in Peril was something that I had looked at uh, not too long ago. Between Canada, you're going to learn a lot of geography and geology and all kinds of things with uh, ecosystems. But uh, my state, Michigan, is the Michigan Mitten, right? We share a common border with Canada. And we date back, we, uh, the United States and Canada, working together. I'd say our first real uh, signatory on any kind of regulations management was like in 1909. Um, it goes before that, but we have a very famous, I don't know why the, the Mountie has his eyes closed in there, but maybe he's taking a nap. But um, when, I, when I was younger, this border, so-called border, there was no border. You basically just went in, I was telling my friends, you go in, you want to go fishing. You, the guy would ask you, you know, what's your business? And I'd say, I'm going fishing. They'd say, good luck. <laughs> you know, it was very low key. And then 9-11 happened and it's changed quite a bit. So there's gonna be a lot of history. There's gonna be a lot of, I hope, I'm gonna get through as much as I can in an hour. I apologize if I zip through some of this stuff because I'll see I'm closing in on the end because an hour is enough for anybody. <laughs> and then questions, I hope, uh, discussion. Because you will, even if you're not a hydrobiologist, if you're not you know, up on this stuff, I'm gonna make it so that it is relatively easy to understand, I right, hope, okay? So kind of a history lesson, well there's me, that's my college <laughs> part of it. Gotta have the, you know, propaganda for you there. So that's me, <laughs> Delta College pioneers. We're a lot smaller than you, the, between eight and 8,000 and about, our highest I think was 13,000, but it usually is around 11 population. So it's pretty small. And yes, I have to have this for Katagina. She's here from, she's like my, I don't know what I would call you, my manager or whatever. She's been so helpful um, during this whole event. And I'll, I'll save that for the end, but thank you. But I'm here because of the Fulbright program and Mikhail and I have been working on it probably for two or three years trying to get here. But I'm kind of proud because it's the 75th anniversary of um, the actual Fulbright program. Notice the date here, 1946, right after the war. Um, J.W. Fulbright, a uh, senator in the United States, determined, he says, hey, we need to know each other, <laughs> right? Maybe we won't be so violent towards each other. Let's establish something where we can share and come and see what we have in common and differences and so on. And it's also the 30th anniversary of the Czech uh, Fulbright program. So this year is a big one. So I'm kind of kind of proud to be here for that. And I always put up a few things. They're, they're called, my students have seen these um, or heard them. They're J-isms, <laughs> things that I keep in my classes. I love this one. Uh, the un think about that a little bit. The unknowing eye cannot see. The unknowing eye cannot see. And that's from Margaret Murray, very famous. If you want to read the book, Two in the Far North, it's about being living in Alaska, a husband and wife team. 
And I love that for science or anything else. Because if you don't recognize something as a problem <laughs> or as a good thing, you won't notice it. You'll walk right past it or drive past it or whatever. And someone who knows will go, oh, look at that. You know, there's a tufted titmouse, <laughs> you know, a bird. And oh, yeah, because they literally don't see it if you don't know it. So we look at like this, some of you that are not macroinvertebrate gurus, like Trichoptera here, our little caddis flies. So you might look at that and go, why is Jay holding a bundle of sticks <laughs> or leaves? Those are organisms. They build those little purse-like things where they get their name, purse, right? And uh, caddis fly to camouflage. So if you don't recognize that, how do you, you, know, you won't appreciate it. So I'm hopefully gonna let you recognize things and become more, I'm gonna open your eyes, I hope, <laughs> by the end. So, where to begin? North America, <laughs> right? If you're, if you're geographically challenged, right? Mexico, right? Central America down here. Here's me, right, the mitten. I'm very happy we, we joke about it, but we do, we always, this is the mitten, the Michigan mitten. The uh, Upper Peninsula gets mad, I'll talk about that later on, because you gotta go like this for the Upper Peninsula, which sits on top. This is the Keweenaw Peninsula, because we're quite a big state. Um, this is the Upper Peninsula right here. Okay, I could use my laser, but it's easier to paint. Um, so, I'll be talking about, obviously, this region, which historically, geologically, has been hermetically sealed, so to speak, in two spots, where, uh, for your hydro, geologists and hydrobiologists, this is the Great Divide, and you look at the Mississippi River here, which is our largest system that comes out here in New Orleans, that watershed, or a basin, they'll call it a basin, or a catchment, there's all different terms, but we use the term watershed, ends right there. <laughs> there's a little, right here's Chicago, if you don't know, this is Detroit over here, and right in there, there's a little narrow, I'll show you another slide, that separates that water, and that's important, you'll see why, um, from the Great Lakes. Over here, it goes out to the Atlantic Ocean, the St. Lawrence Seaway, and these are the five Great Lakes. That'll be the quiz at the end. You should be able to name all five. And you're gonna hear me talk about this, is that it's really one system. Systems management is the critical thing that has changed over the last, even though it was recognized in the 70s, we're starting to do more of it. Looking at the, it's one lake. I mean, it's all connected. It, it isn't isolated. I'll show you pictures to demonstrate what I mean. This is one we humans tend to want to name everything. So this is Lake Ontario, right? This is Lake Erie, the shallowest one. And by the way, you're going as you go north where the receding of the um, glaciers, when they move back, this is the oldest <laughs> lakes, and Superior is the youngest. It's oligotrophic, you know, those terms are very uh, nutrient poor. Uh, low diversity, but high concentrations of like lake trout and things like that. This is very eutrophic. It's solid green, <laughs> very shallow. It's it's going through succession change over the time. It's almost filling up. And Lake Michigan, which is where I grew up, right here, and my college is right there. So this is kind of why I want to show you that more for where the water goes. Okay, the watershed. Now this is a lot of words, <laughs> all right, but I'll summarize that just so you get a little history in your head, four of the lakes are in both U.S. and Canada, and that's why this talk is about our, you know, work together to save the Great Lakes. Um, only one, Lake Michigan, the one that I grew up next to, um, and then they contain one, I love, who are the people that do these? You know, they always, one fifth of the, you know, they, somebody's out there calculating all this stuff, especially this last one, I just, uh, anyway, um, it always cracks me up. But it, there's a lot of, and notice it says surface water. We're not talking groundwater and fresh water and ice, and you guys understand that, I think. <laughs> um, and then many species, they're up to 250, and there's more with the invasive species. Um, this is really interesting, and I'll hit on it. This is, this is critical to my talk, why we're having problems with invasive species and other things. Because you can actually, you know, back up for you here, reach the Atlantic Ocean, go to Minnesota, down here to Chicago, right? From Russia, <laughs> you know? You can come anywhere from Europe, and that's why we have a lot of invasive species. And we'll, we'll talk about why, why that is, okay? 
Um, so you can connect, oops, I forgot to show you the other one. The other one, there are canals that have been built between here and the Mississippi. So you can actually sail all the way down into the Gulf of Mexico. So it's quite interesting. <laughs> uh, body, very complex. Um, and then finally, this is the one, it would be, you know, nine and a half feet. I tried to randomly check there. It's about three meters. You know, the whole United States would be covered. In other words, there's a lot of water there, okay? So here's some superlatives for you. <laughs> big, big things. Uh, surface area, 94,680 square miles. That's 245,000 square kilometers. Uh, drainage area, you can read that. That is a you know, good picture of it over there. Shoreline, 10,000 miles. We have a lot, right? Global surface water. I've seen estimates between 18 and 20. There's a lot of the, the world's fresh water and the problem with that is, it's not a problem, so to speak, but it's everyone wants it. <laughs> There's a lot of people that want to get their hands, and you guys probably know that there have been many wars fought over water rights and so on. We in the United States fought some in the 1800s, and I'm going to talk why that's important. Um, the definition is called uh, Waters of the United States. Okay, Waters of the United States. It's it's held in commons. This goes back two millennium. I mean, it's since humans have really been going, that you can't own water. You can use it. <laughs> but the state, when I say the state, I'm referring to any government agency, anything, right? They hold that in trust, which means you and me can go drink it or get some bottled water, right? There's a difference. We'll talk about selling this versus I'm going to dam up this river and block my neighbor downstream. And that's what happened out west. There were water wars, the sheep, farmers, and uh, cattle. They would like dam up rivers, keep the water for themselves. Well, what about your downstream people? Like, hey, you know, my stream is now dried up, so you can't do that, right? So there's a lot of, in our state especially, there's a lot of stuff that gets legal. Can I wade? in the water next to your land how much how far does your land go under the water you know can you can I paddle my little canoe <laughs> because it's waters of the state so this is a huge huge issue we'll talk about that um, but you can see lots of islands you would I love backpacking um, you know backpacking camping carrying your stuff on your back and there are many many islands oh, they're over here in Georgia Bay I think there's 20,000 over there alone. Some big ones here, that's Beaver Island. You'll hear me talk about that a little bit. And then the two, South Manitou and North Manitou, really nice islands. Um, and so there's some real unique ecology. I was at a botany talk. Remember that guy was talking about isolated islands and this island has a lake that has an island on that lake. I just think that's, you know, it gets to you because you're in this big island and then there's a little lake. There's six lakes on the island. And in that, there's an island in that lake. <laughs> so it's a really unique ecological area. And is there a lake of the, at least a puddle that's wide? No. I knew that. Uh, Wouldn't that be awesome? I should say yes. <laughs> but no. No, because he, he, if you didn't hear Mikel was asking, and then is there another one on that? I uh, don't know. Yes. Yeah. 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 It, it's very unique. It is. It, it's, it, it gives you a unique perspective. And the, and the organisms, you know, and how they, they um, repopulated that. Awesome. You know, I haven't done any studies on it, but I would love to. Um, and it's kind of like, I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but it's Horton, here's a who, I tell my class about it. It's, it's Dr. Seuss, if you don't know who that is. And it's very similar. How small can you go? It just keeps getting smaller and smaller. So it's kind of interesting. So lots of wetlands, but we've lost, well, I'll talk about that. That's been one of our major problems. And it really is the largest system. If you count that, that's definitely true. Freshwater and, you know, because we'll get in arguments with Lake Bacal, you know, we're the biggest, you know, the Russians. And, but, oh, if you go by surface area, you know, we're bigger. In which we are, you know, they're gallons. They have, you know. But who cares? It's big, okay? <laughs> it's really large. Now, who's involved in all this stuff? Um, lots of people, right? Um, the two governments that I'm going to talk about today, and that's a really good map. I'll draw some attention to you there. Um, 55 congressional districts, right? And as you know, anytime you get into politics and science, we're just like you guys. We're no, 
I was here for your lecture, you know. This is very, very, very similar. The more involved numbers of different groups, the worse it gets. It gets just a mess. It's political, not science. So we're changing that a little bit, which I'll talk about. That's why I wanted to bring this subject to you, because it is doable. You can change. <laughs> you can. Um, so lots of people, and these are governments that I should ask the, is there anybody here name all of those? Michigan, that's me, <laughs> Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, New York, Minnesota, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. So all of those states, they're here. This is Minnesota, there's Wisconsin, there's, this is the Upper Peninsula, the UP, UPers that live there, right? I live right in here, I was born over here in Grand Rapids, which I was telling my friends is about 500,000, it's roughly about the same size as this town. Reminds me a lot of, that, of Bruno. Um, how close you are to Canada here. I can drive from my house and go to Sarnia in about three hours. And here's some trivia for you. It's one of the only places, I think it is the only place, where you can drive south, drive, and get into Canada, which is north. <laughs> Figure that one out. Yeah, that's pretty weird, isn't it? But it's true. <laughs> All right. So um, a lot of the, why I like this map is, look at Traverse City, beautiful, wonderful place. But look at where these big cities are if you're not. This is Duluth, right up in Minnesota. This is a place I'll talk about. Um, if you're not French, that's called pronounced Sioux. Sioux Saint Marie, right? Um, so you can tell a tourist because they'll say salt, <laughs> salt ski Marie, something like that. It's a twin city. Uh, half is in Canada, the other half is in the United States. Very unique. Uh, real good college there, Lake Superior State. Uh, real interesting. I'll, I'll bring that up a little bit if we have time. But notice where the people settle. I'll, I'll talk about this more. Look where they are, these big cities. And Grand Rapids is right here, real big city, right? Hamilton, Toronto, here's Ottawa, their capital. Um, and if you went a little bit further, you'd see Montreal and so on, right? Then go along the coasts of the United States. Think of California, think of New York, right? Florida, where do people settle? They settle by water, right? They, they, went, they follow here, we follow the natives. 1600s, like I said, literally. Here and here, and uh, what was it? The, um, well, I'll think of it. The John Jacob Astor and the fur trade, the Hudson Fur Company, all, that all was located there. So our history goes a lot farther here and on the East Coast. But if you go into the middle of the country, 1800s, late 1800s is relatively new and very few people. Very few. <laughs> Wyoming is the least populated state. My home city has more people than Wyoming which is a huge state, very few people. Um, so a lot of players involved, provincial governments, there's two, Ontario and Quebec. Quebec wanted to uh, secede from Canada, they really did. They, had a, they kind of pulled the Scotland thing, but the vote, they were voted down. Um, but I heard rumors from my Canadian friends that they may take another shot, because um, they kind of think of themselves as Frenchmen for some reason. But that's what they want to be, and if they do that, that's going to be really, not good for Canada. And I'm not even sure that uh, Quebec will survive. Um, anyway, who knows? But lots of thousands, municipal by that word, that's cities, townships, things, there's thousands of those involved. Tribes are very important, I'll talk a lot of those. We call them tribes in the US. In Canada, they say First Nation or First Nations, plural. Um, and there are a lot of those, a lot of different tribes. And they have uh, rights as a sovereign, Nation. They're literally negotiated with. We, our original treaties were in the 1800s, and I'll talk about why that's important for managing the Great Lakes. You have to have everybody on board. You can't isolate the tribes for sure. That they, I'll explain that here in a bit. I hope if I have time. But and there are hundreds of stakeholder groups. By that I mean, and you know, non-government organizations, people that are interested in in the Great Lakes and that kind of thing. Lots of people live there, right? There's 35 million, there's about 25 million in the US and 10 in Canada. So it's, there's a lot going on. So why are we so interested in this? Well, some of it obviously is going to be related to human health, okay? And Chicago, my friends in Chicago, there's nobody from Chicago here I hope, but the city of filth. <laughs> you like that? City of filth. It was known as a nasty, in, in, in America, we come up with these weird names for places and they kind of stick. I mean, that was in the 1800s and they still say that. It's the Windy City, but anyway, they had a lot of problems with pollution, water pollution. Cleveland, which is no, it's in Ohio, it's known as the mistake 
on the lake. <laughs> Don't let Cleveland people again, they'll, they'll kill me for that, but mistake on the lake. Yeah, they have a lot of problems. One of them is their, uh, they kept moving their intake pipe, right, where their water comes in. They just kept <laughs> shoving it out farther. Well, they ran out of room. They were out five miles, eight kilometers. <laughs> you know, in Detroit, they had sewers that they dumped right into the lake directly without treatment in the 1870s. Sarnia, remember that one? <laughs> That's a Canadian city right across from um, Port Huron by my house. In the 1800s, this is one of my favorites, and this is not uncommon. This happened in Michigan, one of our cities too. Their intake, that's where their water that they drink, comes in, it's only 37 meters from their pure sewage. So it was like a big circle, you know? Poop, poop it out and drink it back in. Yeah, not, not a good idea, right? Uh, you want to talk about you know fecal coliform and E. coli and th yeah, not good. And then oh, I was right. I did nail the date. <laughs> Boundary Waters Treaty. That was the first big one. Boundary between Canada and the U.S. And then we started seeing real bad industrial pollution into the teens. You know, 1910, 11, 12, that kind of thing. And it coincides with the lumbering, uh, which wiped out. I'll talk about that. Wiped out all the trees in Canada. But it's important that one in particular because they recognize. We've got an issue here. But they were so into the human concept, all of us have it. You have it at your home. You know, this is mine. In the US especially, we put up a fence. You know, this is mine. It's not my name, this is mine. You don't own the land, <laughs> you're borrowing it until you die, right? Um, Native Americans are like that. They, they belong to the land. That's the way they look at it, <laughs> right? We don't own the land, right? We're temporary holders of it. But we tend to put labels on things and say, okay, this is our water, and I'll show you why that's important. Say, there's, and it's just a little dash line, and you know, if I put my foot here and here, here I'm in Canada, here I'm in Michigan. You know, really? <laughs> so um, that's an issue, and this became a real big issue in, the, in around 1910, but it was really just before the First World War. Things started really getting bad. Um, some more stuff, well, this is why I already told you the intense logging. This is actually a, a picture that I took. No, I'm not that old. <laughs> That's from the 1800s. Uh, my students actually asked me, did you take it? <laughs> they're funny. They think they're funny. No, I didn't take the picture. <laughs> but that's from an area near my cabin, um, up by Gaylord, Michigan. And it was completely covered by white pine, Pinus scrubus. Michigan State tree. Great big, huge, three, four hundred year old trees. Climax, do we call just climax community, right? Yep, well, not anymore. <laughs> they thought it would take, they estimated the lumber people, because remember, this is two, two people in a cross cut saw, two, two men, typically. They said it would take a hundred years. It took about ten. Yeah, <laughs> wiped it out. And most of it went to Chicago to build Chicago. Uh, actually, right after the, the Chicago fire, the famous burned Chicago, we built the city basically back up again with white pine. So it's a huge thing, uh, clearing the fields. A lot of farmers came in. Um, lumber and paper, of course, big. There's still, it's a renewable resource. If those guys, those, those old folks over here, would have been planting as they cut down, we'd be fine. It's a renewable resource. Forestry is one of those you can plant and harvest, do select cut, don't go in and just, you know, decimate everything. It led to the destruction of the, the um, grayling, the arctic grayling of native species because of this. So, lumbering. So what did they do? They developed dams, <laughs> right? These are everywhere, and I know in your country, um, I even learned that from my students in stream ecology, they talked about the dams and trying to remove some and things like that. We have lots of them, 10,000 probably more than that, these kind um, built during the lumber era. And there, as you know, they're inhibiting you know, migration, obviously. A certain, this is a fish ladder, actually, if you're familiar. Fish ladder, fish swim over here. So you can help them over. So that was a big thing, right? Um, and then finally, industry. Of course, they want the water, <laughs> right? They're gonna use it for industrialization or manufacturing but a big part of it you know and this is especially my state but this was real big in in uh, Pennsylvania you know Pittsburgh and, you know about the steel steel city and of course you know Detroit right the cars 
Motor City, and then transportation, how we move around, right? So um, that was key. Ah, finally. Now, remember what I told you how we were kind of hermetically sealed? Anybody know what that is? No, it isn't in the African continent. So. Yep, Niagara Falls. <laughs> yep, there's actually two of them, but this is one. And this is actually a little, to give those of you that have never seen it, it's beautiful, you should go there, both sides. Canada is actually better. Or, <laughs> I shouldn't say that either, but the city, are Anyway, this is a little tour boat and it goes underneath and yeah, it's really cool to go if you get a chance to do it. But obviously this would be an impediment to any organism that's trying to move through that system, right? Pretty, pretty straightforward there. Well, humans said we need to get up into there. Remember what I told you, hermetically sealed? Well, it's not sealed anymore. They built something called the Welland, Welland Canal around that in Canada, all right? You know, the U.S. picks up a lot of bad press. We get like, oh, you guys are, you don't care. Right. Actually, Canada's really done some things without asking us, <laughs> right? And just did it, this, this looks good, without doing any kind of environmental or anything. And so this is, this is important that we agreed, okay? So that's one, remember that one. The second one, remember how I told you the watershed comes, literally, it flows from up here in Canada, Mississippi goes all the way down here and comes out uh, by New Orleans. There's a little spot in there where they cut some canals right here, because this is the dividing line of the watershed, right? A drop of water that hits here goes that way into the Mississippi. One that goes here goes into Lake Michigan. Make sense, right? So look how close, right? So they cut through there, get into the river, which flows into the Mississippi River, which flows into the Gulf, right? So when you're thinking, when I start talking about invasive species like carp, not the ones you guys eat, right? <laughs> Um, these are, well, kinda, there's actually four of them. They're referred to as Asian carp. And that's not really fair, because there's actually four kinds, right? Several of them are Asian, <laughs> but they all get a bad name, right? The, the carp, the big head and the grass carp, there's silver carp, there's a lot. And we're terrified, we that live in this area are terrified that they're gonna hop from here to here. They got into the Mississippi River by just like we were talking in class, I think, about um, you know, how you raise your, your carp. That's why we don't eat carp. We can consider them trash fish because they eat really gross stuff. We were talking about before I came here. They really do. And they, they literally, Mikhail's saying, they'll eat every, um, whatever's there. And they'll just be mud. I mean, they did the sediment, murk, it's terrible. They were brought in to do that in fish uh, raceways where they raise fish, okay, and where were those? They were in the Mississippi River, along the river, right? These, a raceway, it's a big place, you know, like a pond, think of a pond. And they wanted to clear those out, so they brought in carp. Well, what happens in the spring in a big watershed? What happens? You get lots of rain, you get a flood. So what happens to all those carp? They get flushed into the river, exactly. So it took them a while, they were down here, but they're right there. There's four, some came from other, uh, some were literally uh, like um, released by the people uh, illegally brought from Canada and they ooh, throw them in across the Windsor Bridge. Yeah, yeah, they've been, we got, fit, you know, they have cameras everywhere now and people are like, ah, whoop, you know, because these are big, you, you can't miss them, you know, they're, they're big. Well, I'll show you a funny picture here. That, well, it wasn't too funny for the guy, but anyway, so that's how, they're the right here, and you guys that are DNA gurus, we found we, when I say we, and it wasn't me, but reading about it, I've been, I try to keep up on this stuff, right? And we found E, you know, environmental DNA from all four species in, actually one of them was in Lake Erie. E, we, we don't, we've not found a single specimen, no eggs, no, you know, no fish, you know, but nothing. But eDNA, which you go, oh, then they must have been, well, no, it's, if it's in the water, right, you might, so we're wondering, are they already here? So there's a lot of sampling, a lot of things, because if they get in there, we'll never get rid of them, and they will affect that system greatly um, by their, just their behavior and what they do. And here's how they do it, <laughs> right? These, we call them ISGs and ISIs, all different, but it's basically invasive species. 
these canals we talked about, oh, and I had to have one of these. We've got to have our, our muscles, you know. Um, but zebra, everyone's heard of those because you guys have them, don't you? Yeah. Zebra, yeah. The river. The river, yeah. They just, we got, ours spread around really easy because of fishermen. They would attach to our boats. You know, we have, we have the second most boat, boating licenses in the Union, in the whole United States. You'd think it would be like Florida or something. It's Michigan. We have tons of people, and they, the bar, little guys are like a barnacle, and they stick with their little bissel threads in the hand, and we get them, and they, they're in our bait buckets, and they don't, yeah, they've spread. But they're not the worst ones now, because we, we, we had, they came so long ago, some of our native, like our docks, and they're, they're eating them. They're, they're getting competition. They really had a real bad effect on our native mussels, though. Oh my gosh. I mean, literally just covering the, the shell. And filter their filter feed you non <laughs> they filter feed they filter the water they literally steal everything that poor little muscle native muscle and yeah they had a huge impact you can literally walk on the beaches and cut your feet on them it's nothing but zebra mussel shells but there's a new one called the quagga mussel that's even doing better <laughs> so um, this is a round goby pretty famous one uh, our lady likes it looks like a sculpin. Sorry mm -hmm. yep. I guess you have both species. Mm -hmm. uh, the left one is a quokka. Uh, yeah, the probably. The is not flat. And, and it probably is the, the, that didn't take that picture, but I agree with you. The zebra. Because zebra has more, this one actually, you probably know why the quagga muscle got quagga. <laughs> it has less. And this one, there is a head keel mm -hmm. and flat bottom. Mm -hmm. And this one is both sides are rough. Yep. And what else? There's some more stuff. It doesn't have typically as many stripes, right? It's just like the, that's obvious name zebra, because that quagga. Does anybody know what? Here's one for you, quagga. Zebra. Yeah, uh, uh, an extinct zebra. <laughs> it was an animal that did exist. Yeah, so it's yeah. Isn't that cool? But yes, that's exactly. So we'll we, we'll show you that here in a bit. So good job. <laughs> you pass. You can go now. Um, and the spiny water flea. Oh my goodness, those little stinkers, they sit on your, when you fish, it attaches itself to the line. This is the Welland Canal, I have a better pic picture of it. Uh, blood red. These are just examples, remember there's 180 of them, there's more, there's 183, and none of them, none, zero, have ever been, and I'm talking plants, algae, everything, all organisms. Um, they come in on the ballast, people do trade in the live organisms and release them. Um, I talked about fishing, but ballast, you guys know? You know, shipping, I know we're a landlocked country here, but um, if you're not familiar with that, see how high in the water that ship is riding? See that? The, the, he's got to take on some ballast when he's coming empty or going. Because they'll come and they'll pick up uh, like um, iron ore uh, taconite pellets up in the big heavy to make steel. So it's very heavy. And if you don't know anything about the Great Lakes or even the ocean, you have pitch and roll and you, you'll sink if you are top heavy. So you take on water in your native land. If you're wondering what ballast water is to take on weight so that you ride better. So what do you do when you arrive in, oh, I don't know, Duluth, Minnesota, and you're picking up your, or Marquette, Michigan, you're getting your steel, what happens to that water? <laughs> yeah, you pump it out into the Great Lakes. It's illegal, but they do it. And that's where a lot of our little friends arrive, right? So that's another way they get it. But they also come around um, the obstruction. That is the Welland part of the Welland Canal. It's called the Bypass St. Lawrence Seaway. These are big, if you're not familiar with the lock system, lock, right? That, see how that ship up here? Let's see if I can get my little pointer. Right up there, see that? They come up, and these are at different levels, obviously. You've seen that's, that's the waterfall, <laughs> right? And the same is true, I'll show you, in the Sioux Locks up in uh, um, the UP. This is, it drops down or fills you up. It takes quite a while for each ship uh, to pass through, but obviously it can get through and not have to go around or through the uh, waterfall, which is not gonna work. And that, my friends, is where this guy came from. Everybody know what that is? It's a lamprey, it's a sea lamprey, yep, yep. Petromyzonidae is the family. Petromyzon, uh, what is it? Marine, I think? Marinus, because it's a sea lamprey. If you don't know what that means, this is a parasitic, on fish, <laughs> really, really nasty critter. I worked for the, the um, US Fish and Wildlife Service one summer, 
when I was in college, and this was my job, is to catch lamprey, <laughs> right? And lamprey are really ugly, as you can see. Um, <laughs> question usually comes up from my students that, I mean, this looks like something that should be a parasite, right? So you look at it and you go, well, did, did that, if I was out swimming, would that, make, you know, that's always, because th these are, Yep, they're big. Yep. So you're do do ah, you know. <laughs> you think they do? Remember the fish, because they're looking for a fish, like a lake trout or something. You think if you were swimming around, one of those would swim up and attach himself to you? Probably not. You're not what they're looking for. But could they? Yes. Because <laughs> we do the tests. We, we're kind of we're we're young, we're college. <laughs> so we've got our waders on, but it's hot, so we have our shirts off. You're not supposed to because you're a federal employee, but we're in the middle of nowhere, right? So we're collecting, and, and the, the trick was to take, see how this, this is glass? He's, he's stuck on, this is, a, this is called a buccal funnel, you know, like that buccal funnel? And then you see all these little teeth, and then this is a radula, like an octopus or anything. It's really, really like a, see the teeth on it? <laughs> it's really, it's a wood rasp, if you don't know if you're a woodworker, like a file. Right? So this is a muscle contracting like a suction cup. So you can really stick them on you. So if you're really good, if your buddy's you know, working on the trap, you can take one of these and stick it right on his back. And he's like, <laughs> <laughs> he can't get it. <laughs> so, now, would it dig in and bend? No. If they hang on for a while and, and would you leave one of these on you? Of course not. That's what I would say. Even if it did attach itself, I mean, you probably know this, wouldn't you? <laughs> say, you pull it off. Yeah, they're not, you don't have to worry about that. Now a fish does though, right? Because they stick on there and they use their muscles, contractions, tighten, tighten. These teeth will just dig right in through those scales. That's why they like lake trout because they have real fine, basically no scales, soft skin and they can kill them easy. They're not trying to kill them if you know anything about parasites, all you biologists out there, right? It's a great way to live, parasite. It is, a lot of my students think it's a, like a rare type of, of lifestyle. It's actually extremely common. There are parasites in everything, right? They do quite well. They don't want to kill their hosts, at least immediately, right? They need a blood meal, right? So they attach themselves, squeeze in, and then they use a little radula to dig a hole inside of the fish, right? Suck out what they need, and then they drop off. And it leaves, a, and they don't put a band-aid on it. They leave, <laughs> they leave a big hole in the side, and you'll catch a fish, and it'll have a lamprey scar on it. We call it lamprey scar. Usually, one on a big fish, they'll survive. If they get two, and then they don't get saprolignia, it's a fungus an infection. It's white. It kills them after a while. Uh, it also makes them really anemic, just like you. <laughs> if I sucked all your blood out, you. Feel kind of, you know, the fish gets a little woozy, you know, so it's not good. They don't want them, and but once they're on there, they'll never get them off. Fish will like go in the gravel and do this, try to knock them off. But these guys got in through and around the Welland Canal, and they're there to stay. We've got since they came in, these are actual pictures that I took, <laughs> right? Um, on June 25th, just before I came here, my wife and I went up to um, the Sioux. See how it's S O O, and that's what the locals call it, Sioux. I'm going to the Sioux, right? The Sioux Locks. And um, it allows uh, ocean vessels, obviously, to navigate, I already told you that, between Michigan. Um, and so the, the Lake Huron and the Twin Cities, we call them, the Sioux Saint Marie, right? And they're the Twin Cities because they literally are. This is the bridge that goes across into Canada, okay? And there's absolutely no traffic on it today because that was Canada. Well, I think they just opened or their border was closed, which really hurt Canada. That their um, recreational fishing, hunting, all that, everything comes from Michigan, and they lost a lot of commerce. But these are the big. I I picked this one. See if anybody can tell where that ship came from, just to show you it's international. Hunnegrok. It's not German. Dutch. Yes, Dutch. You knew with Van Houten, I had to have a Dutch ship coming through. And you can see, it's a good one. Here's the size of the guys. And no, they're not pulling the ship with the rope. Mm -hmm. And then some other ones coming through. They're passing each other, actually. And this is the Corps of Engineers flag, not any country's flag. And you, just like you saw before, they'll come into the first lock, right? And because the water's going this way, it's heading out into the Atlantic Ocean. So it's higher, right, here. So when you come in lower, they'll pull in and then 
they fill up. You can watch, you can, it's so slow. I wanted to do a video clip, but it wasn't working too good, but it's so slow, you can stand, you can put your hand on the side of the ship and it would do this. It's really cool. And then when they move, that's why these guys are just Because it, it's amazing, because if these huge, if you understand physics and mass, if one of these things whammed into this, it would be amazing to watch because it would just go and just push right into it and very slowly. <laughs> but it's hard to stop that once it's in motion. So they kind of do the ease into it and then the next lock and the next lock and then the way they go. So it's pretty cool and it was a big point during the war, believe it or not, World War II. There was a lot of fear that if the Germans <laughs> came and bombed that, and it is true, they would have cut off all steel, all, it would have really affected the war. Um, there was actually a plot to do that. The, the Germans made it in a submarine, they went into Canada, but then they got caught. So, didn't, didn't work, I don't know. But anyway, ah, here we go. Invasion of the flying fish, <laughs> all right? This is the, not this part, but those, the picture up there is, is true. That is a carp. Um, one of the weird things these Asian carp do, and this is my favorite shot, Are you guys ready? This is a real one, I didn't take it. A friend of mine did though, you ready? <laughs> Look at that guy's face, whoa! Would you wanna get clubbed in the head with a 20 pound, you know? I don't think so. This is where he came flying out of. What happens is when you're in a motorboat, like he is the motor, we don't know exactly why, but it just, boom, it startles them. And you can see all of those that are jumping and leave it to the Americans, but we have a competition, we compete in everything. There's a, a competition to see how many of those you can catch in a net when they're flying. And they, guys, seriously, they wear like football helmets. <laughs> yeah. And they go in and they're like scooping them up and, and doing all this stuff. And, and believe it or not, the Michigan Outdoor Writers Association, my, my group, I used to be the president of them, uh, they won. It was like Indiana, Ohio. Yeah, they won the competition. It was pretty cool. And only one concussion. <laughs> so that's very dangerous as you can see this is not so they not only are bad for the environment they're literally bad for your health or could be okay <laughs> could knock you out well there you go why should we care well it, it, aquatic invasive species and you know there's acronyms for everything 180 plus we can't there's probably more that we just aren't aware of and why we care there's good old uh, Petrus Zymonidae there the sea lamprey and the alewife that one was actually brought in on purpose the alewife. Does anybody know why that is? Why would we bring something in, release it, and then, oh my God, it's, it's not for pets, it's not for... Another invasive species we have, not invasive because we brought it in, is salmon. Pacific salmon. I'm giving you a hint about the alewife. It's a... No, <laughs> but you're close. You've got the two right, one's eating the other one. This is a food source for the salmon. Because they were eating all of our native species. So, oh, bring in the alewife. <laughs> to control, you know, it just is one of those bad things. So, yeah, not good. Um, but only two have been controlled. Only two, right, out of the whole group. Um, and by controlled, we mean kept the numbers lower, right? Um, these in particular, because they were decimating the fish populations. I gotta get going here. But you know, we are stuck with them. Once they're there, literally not one of them is gone. We, we still find the ones, whether well, purple loose strife, which is a flower, <laughs> and ornamental is beautiful. And I shouldn't pick on Dave. Dave, Dave Clark's a good friend of mine, always promoting all this stuff. But anyway, he's, his dad decided that purple loose strife is very nat. Once it's in the wetland, it completely takes over, cattail, everything. It's just solid flower, and you're like, oh, isn't that pretty? It's purple. Well, nothing eats it, nothing, the muskrat, I mean, it's horrible. So what did Dave's dad do? Yeah, he went and dug some up, brought them, put them in his pot. I'm like, Dave, no! So anyway, he, Dave is a biologist, he should know better, right? So, we, once, we, once we have them, we're stuck, okay? Um, humans, this is us poor old cows, you know, they're in trouble again, not only for their methane, Yes, you know, and all the problems. This is nice, this is not pea soup. That is algae, right? You can see the nice photo here. Of the, uh, this is like Erie, kind of hard to, to tell, to acclimate yourself. That's Detroit over there, right? And this is an aerial photo, obviously, in the satellite imagery. It, we get a lot of problems with that shallow, eutrophic, high nutrient load. Um, people spelling out help on the beach. 
Um, they were able to identify these stressors, 43 of them. We call them areas of concern. You like that? Yeah, we should be concerned. Two thirds of roughly, we could figure again, of wetlands are filled, drained, or developed. Huge issue, because we don't have time to go into all that stuff. And of course, the toxic stuff, air, water discharge, non-point source pollution. A lot of this is ancient, it's old. Even the topic I'm gonna plug at the end for you guys if you wanna come to the hydro. Uh, lab one that we're going to do on um, dioxins, um, something that I, I study. And then invasive species, of course, loss of biodiversity. There's lots of things going on. These are stressors. These, this is one of my best photographs ever. That is by my, near my home. That is Grand Haven State Park. And this is uh, um, a pier and the lighthouse, obviously. But see this thing here? People are like, what is that? That's so that the light keeper, see here, he'd be dead. He hangs on for dear life climbing across the, and in the winter time that freezes over, it's beautiful, it's, just, it's covered in, in ice. Pretty, pretty impressive. So weather, fish diseases, population cycles, some of the natural type things, um, sediments, phosphorus, contaminants, waste like this, this is what we were talking about, the outfall, you know, comes in here. Those, by the way, are regulated um, by government agencies, it's called a NPDES permit, <coughs> National Pollution Discharge Elimination System, but nobody seems to follow, <laughs> so you get a lot of this. Um, what we call end of pipe uh, remediation. In other words, let's just put a filter on there, or like in your car, catalytic converter, let's just collect it, put it in carbon. All you're doing is moving the pollutant from one area to another, it's like putting a, a filter on a smokestack, you know, that's spewing out pollution, so you put a filter on there, which we do, but all you're, you're not really, it's not pollution prevention, you're just stuck. So we've moved from that to preventative, which is way better. Um, physical restructuring, yikes, I gotta get going here. Um, dams, seawalls, uh, this is another one of my pictures. You can see the lakes are amazing, aren't they? The, the power of, of water, um, it's amazing. Uh, we've removed non-renewable resources like water withdrawal. Canada did some. The U.S. did some. I'll tell you about a... There's actually a plan on the books from what's called uh, the Corps of Engineers. It's a big uh, name of a plan. Basically to take water from the Great Lakes and pipe it down to like um, Texas, Oklahoma. They want our water for irrigation. And it was put on the books in the 1950s, 60s maybe. Um, and it's still there. Like, they want that water. And the only thing that stopped them was the interstate, which I'll talk about, and the Canadian government and the tribes. That was what saved us from not you know, losing our water. Well, here's some, this is what changed everything, okay? This was a big one. Um, that is the Cuyahoga River, the mistake on the lake. It caught on fire. It wasn't actually the water, obviously, but it was the pollution that was in there. It's actually the vapors, mists, and fumes that come off from the chemicals. It was so polluted that it literally caught on fire. And that didn't take uh, in 1960s. It basically doesn't take a biologist or anyone else to go, gee, that's probably not real good, <laughs> right? When your rivers are catching on fire. So <laughs> yeah, and then in the 60s, and that's actually, that's Cuyahoga River. That's when the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, there'll be a quiz later on all these acronyms. Um, the Environmental Protection Agency was founded in 1972, and a long time ago for you young'uns, but for us, it's not that long ago, if you think about it. And it was Richard Nixon, you know, he gets a lot of bad press too, but he was a weird guy. He, had, he was really into the environment and health. He created OSHA, Occupational Safety and Health Administration, and the Environmental Protection Agency, two of the largest and most important things we have today, so. Not, all, not everybody's all bad, right? Uh, Great Lakes Water Quality Agreements, that's what I'm gonna talk about for the rest of the time. There he is, we call him Tricky Dick, right? There's, if you've never, you young people, this is Richard Nixon, <laughs> one of our presidents, right? And can anybody who win a prize name who that guy is? He's associated with Canada, and you know, actually. Pierre Trudeau? Yes, the winner, Pierre Trudeau. And who's, who's the minister now? His son. <laughs> So it's all in the family in Canada. So there they are, signing in 72. That was a huge deal. This was huge. Great Lakes Water Quality. We basically said, nobody's touching our water. <laughs> Canadians, US, without all of us agreeing. You can't move it, you can't, you know, it was huge. 
So that was really important because they were looking at things like this. This is metric tons dropping to see, ooh, that, that had a huge effect on it, on uh, the usable uh, part of, uh, of uh, the phosphorus load. So algae was dropping. They looked at a bunch of, I'm going relatively fast because there's a lot to do here. So there were these areas of concern they were looking at. Um, in 78, in 87, they came up with another version of these agreements, and they're plural agreements, so there's multiple ones. And I don't want to bore you with all you don't care, really, but just to know the history, there's their preliminary report on uh, 2010. And then this was a big moment, because look, it's 2012, but here we are in 2021, and they still haven't redone, redone it. They were supposed to do it, you know, like every five to ten years, and so... We're stretching it out, but 2012 was the last time they added these things, these annexes and stuff. So it began in 1980s, right? Result, we got the charter, um, 90s case by case, 98, this was big, big group, this Nova group, that came together and created these annexes, which are like appendix <laughs> to the agreements. This was a big one, Great Lakes St. Lawrence River Basin Water Resource Compact. And then notice it was signed in 2005, but it wasn't approved until, it takes years for this stuff to move, unfortunately, all the politics and everything. To actually do, this is one of my favorite, this is in Michigan. <laughs> Back off, suckers. Water diversion, the last straw. So we've got Texas, Utah, California, New Mexico, and they're all interested in our water, right? And they are. <laughs> but what's nice about this agreement, it's legally binding interstate, so all the states and the provinces, Right? Quebec and um, Ontario. So that, folks, is what saved our water. Because if it was just Michigan fighting or just Wisconsin, or we probably would have lost out to the Corps of Engineers. But since it was international, they couldn't do anything, you know, because they we had an international agreement. So it saved us. It really, it's the best thing that could have ever happened. Another thing that we just said sucking it out, it's really quantity of water we're concerned with. Um, it is legally binding, we just said that, provincial, right? But it allows your behavior of your water diversion. Well, how you divert it, what you do. Canada had a big plan, I won't go into it, to divert Lake Superior water and use a bunch for uh, drinking water, and I forget what, and that was stopped by the, these agreements. I said, no, wait a minute, because the U.S. tried something similar, like I said, with the canal, and so this is really important. Um, and then, it, you know, water is a huge on economic development, of course. So it recognizes that. It bans new diversions. You can't just go in there, oh, we'll dig a canal, and, right? So it, that's big. States and provinces, they have a consistent standard for using the water. So that's big. And then this is just, you know, more binational. It means two <laughs> countries, federal, state, and regional, local, non-government agencies or organizations. Um, some more, <laughs> there's lots of them, you don't have to know them all, but Boundary Water Treaty, I already mentioned that one before, that was really what got things going and I wanted to show you that. International Joint Commission, IJC, that is in um, Michigan, it's in Ann Arbor, um, associated a little bit with the University of Michigan, but um, it's in our state, which we're kind of proud of. And then um, this convention in 54 established something that was really huge, this uh, Great Lakes Fisheries to manage the fish, because you can probably imagine how many people really want to fish. They not only want to fish fish, recreational, but there's commercial fishery, right? And so, and then the tribes, because it's called uh, subsistence fishing, to, to eat, to get food. And they have treaties that go back that they've signed and we have to renegotiate. Because remember when the treaty was written, the literally the, the native was you know spearing, and they had agreements they could take as long as they had food. Now, well, now they have boats with seine and gill nets, and they're scooping up you know millions of. A little different, so they had to renegotiate those, and that that was hard. It took ten years, and remember each tribe is and, and original nations from Canada. Those are all like little governments, right? So, lots of negotiation going on. Uh, let's see, governance federal, all these are all the United States. There's just a couple I wanted to point out. NOAA, <laughs> you might be familiar with that one, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Um, and then this one, EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, and the Great Lakes National Program Office, again, in Michigan. Kind of, kind of proud of that. Uh, we kind of are centralized because you saw, we're the only one, we're the peninsula, we're surrounded <laughs> you know, by the Great Lakes. So we tend to have a lot of meetings, and there's one I'll show you a picture, they always have it on Mackinac Island it's real pretty. 
All these people involved. Not, ooh, <laughs> I'm running out of time. Great Lakes Commission. Uh, Council of Great Lakes Governors. Great Lakes St. Lawrence. He's not even there anymore. But um, you know, he's from Quebec. Um, here's our guy. John Allen isn't there anymore either. Um, but they implement these state policies, coordinate things. Each state has their own. I just gave you some examples. All right, different states. So a lot of players. Um, these are the, the you know, non-government agencies, and I wanted to plug them for a couple reasons. And since we're running out of time, I'll just show a couple. This one is the Michigan United Conservation Clubs, MUCC. I belong to that one. That's why I like that one. That is hunters, fishermen, outdoorsmen, bird watchers, anybody that's interested in conservation. Um, and of course this. We have to point out this. Notice who I listed first. I would be in real deep doo-doo if I hope nobody went to the U of M or Michigan State. These are Big Ten schools. These are the big ones, you know, 80,000 students. <laughs> I notice I list them last. But um, Delta and SDSU, Saginaw Valley State University, formed this, Saginaw Bay Monitoring Coalition. If any of you are interested in finding out more, get a hold of me because we're working on that right now. You'll hear more about it um, if you come to the other seminar. And of course, businesses. This is huge. Shipping on the Great Lakes, the carriers, and then I left one off that's the recreational fishermen, huge charter, charter boat. You go pay to go on a boat to go fishing. Billions of dollars in industry. So there's a lot of money involved. Um, there's Debbie Stabenow, that's one of our senators, um, for Great Lakes Restoration, a new program, a new initiative. There we are back to Tricky Dick. 2012, boom, there's those annexes that came along, looking at areas of concern, lake-wide management, chemicals, all this stuff, right? So the EPA, we'll skip that. This is the one I wanted to show you before we get too much. At the end, those pink ones up there, those are diverted drainages already that Canada did. Um, and this is our uh, basic map of the drainage. Um, again, coming back to our fires, just to remind you that the International Joint Commission oversees rivers catching on fire. You stick your hand in there. Can you imagine going swimming in there? I don't think so. I would guess it's probably pretty hypoxic. There's not a lot of oxygen left there. So these Great Lakes Water Quality Agreements, to kind of wrap this up for you guys, um, the key initially was to get rid of the phosphorus, the nutrient loading, because um, they were mostly aware of that. Um, and then they, in 78, they looked at more of the ecosystem approach, which I mentioned to you guys. And then finally in 87, those area of concern. And this is one of my favorite. DDT is good for me. You guys are familiar with DDT, probably? It's not good for you, <laughs> but um, they thought it was. And why did we use it? And why do we use the term DDT? Well, try saying trichlorodiphenyl, trichloroethane every time you want to say it, right? It has a lot of chlorine, is what that's saying. Di, you know, two and three. And yeah, it's heavily chlorinated. Real nasty from a central nervous system disruptor to uh, um, problems with reproduction. Yeah, it, it, and why do we use these toxic things? Because they work. They work really well. And it's still used today to eliminate uh, malaria, mosquitoes, which carry malaria, because if you're dying, your child's dying, you're living in an African country, and your child's dying from malaria, you're gonna use whatever it takes, and they use DDT, right? And which gets airborne and comes over. And we used to use it a lot. You like that? They're spraying the sheep. Anybody could probably spot this from World War II, right? This is the prisoners of war and the concentration camps and the Jewish people. This is a British officer literally delousing people with DDT. Does anybody know where DDT was the, the guy that came up with it? It wasn't the U.S. It was in Austria, actually, initially, and then the guy that really got it and discovered the, the properties, I believe, was from Switzerland or maybe Germany. I don't remember exactly, but it was right in the... Obviously, just before, I think it was in 39, and then after the war, it was used a ton, literally. And if you want to learn about dioxins, come see my talk. That's the title of it, Dioxin Sermon, which is later, December. In this, you'll see stuff like this. You'll see a little more science. This is a very busy thing, but it basically is to show you, I live over here, <laughs> right, um, up in this area, okay? And there's several rivers come together, and this is the Tittabawassee River that flows down here and flows into the Saginaw River, which goes into the Saginaw Bay. And it's all contaminated with dioxin and a bunch of other stuff. 
<laughs> and each one of these little boxes shows you things like bank stability pilot where they're fixing up the banks if you guys are into stream remediation. Um, these red ones are high priority because they had lots of dioxin in them. The purple ones, right, are exposure units where people could get exposed to dioxin. And these little green ones, right, those are interim remedial actions you know, that to um, stop the heavy pollution going on. So if you want to hear more about that and how that affects the biology and even out here into the bay, in the Saginaw Bay, I'll be glad to talk to you about it. We don't have time to go through all this, but it's showing this is really good. There's good news. PCBs have been dropping, you know, since 2007 in the carp. I kind of had this as a joke, you know, oh, don't eat carp because they got mercury in them. In parts per million, 90% of them, right, that they sampled had detectable limits, detectable limits, right? And then the International Joint Commission is basically the watchdog, independent assessment of the Great Lakes, their meetings, we already told about that. Biennial means every other year, not, you know, every other year, so every two years. That's what they look at. You can see the algae blooms, real nice. There's Windsor in Detroit, Windsor's in Canada, Detroit's in Michigan, Toledo is in Ohio, and there's the mistake on the Lake Cleveland. You can see a lot of the nutrients from there. Here's the Maumee River in Ohio. Um, this was going really well. A lot of people look at that and go, things were going really well, and then what happened, <laughs> right? And these are the full weighted mean concentrations to, by the flow. Things were going really well, and then, well, what do you think happened here? How come the phosphorus, uh, the dissolved reactive phosphorus is the bioavailable type stuff. What do you think happened right about in here? Things were going really well. Remember, because they started in 72, right, with the clean up the phosphorus. What happened right in here? Yes, we got input. He's talking about in here in the back. They were in the historical releases that were held, but there was also another reason, which was increasing use of phosphorus in fertilizer. You know, nitrogen, even though it was regulated, um, there was a loophole. And then farming practices, which gets into what you were saying, the way the um, soil, the way they, they tilled it, there was no uh, green strips, you know, and all that kind of stuff, and we don't have time to get it, but it basically, whoa, <laughs> this is not good. And then there's our buddy, you know, the lamprey, here we go, here you go, get excited there. <laughs> and that's, that's the right one, right? It's supposed to be a picture of a quagga mussel. And uh, you can see they weren't there in 95. And then 2000, a few of them up in here, and then look at my 2010, they're all over the place. They did just like the regular zebra mussel did. All right, that they're concerned with this kind of sea. You see a lot of signs that say, you know, due to, well, it's a blurred picture. Maybe you were contaminated, right? But that's typically from E. coli um, outbreaks and, and uh, poor um, moist water treatment. And then the new one, I'm gonna promise you, I'm gonna wrap up here, respond to emerging threats, things are coming. Increased focus on prevention, thank you, please do that. And then this one I put a question mark because of supposedly accountability, which means who's going to pay, right? I don't know. That one is, it's supposed to carry more weight. In other words, a hammer to hit the nail, you know, that you're a violator, boom. But the International Joint Commission, which was formed a long time ago, still, and, and it's in Michigan, like I said, um, these are their areas of concern. They're AOCs, these little dots. There's only one by me, right there. Saginaw Bay, mostly because of dioxin, <laughs> my friend. And this is what I like a lot. Ecosystem approach, which lake is which, does the fish know the difference, right? Because this is the mighty Mac. This is the Mackinac Bridge, not Mackinac, Mackinac Bridge, five miles long. Goes into this little strip of land here is in the UP, the Upper Peninsula. And you guys tell me which one's Lake Michigan and which one's Lake Huron. Lake Michigan, Lake Huron, seriously. <laughs> there's under the bridge, there's a little sign, because tourists come, yeah, there's a sign that says Lake Michigan. You walk, literally what, Lake Huron, right. Does a fish know? I don't think so, <laughs> right? We have to manage them as, as a group. All of the people involved, it's an ecosystem. We're all connected, it's interconnected. Biologists know that, and you can see how big it is. It's an ocean-going vessel going underneath. The bridge, by the way, on high wind advisories, that bridge swings <laughs> and they stop the traffic. And there's only been one fatality 
and it was uh, Yugo. Do you remember the Yugo, if you're old enough? It was made in Yugoslavia. A little tiny car, like you guys ride. <laughs> it launched, because this has a metal strip through it. This is a grade, so that the wind can come up through, right, and not destroy the bridge. And it's really fun to drive over that, and it goes, you know, because you're going over a grate. But if you're a real Michigander, you open your door, my wife will never do it, I always do it. As you're driving, you gotta drive pretty fast. They have, they have speed limits on it, but to drive a little fast. Open that door and you're going so fast, you can't see the grate anymore. All you see is water. And it gives you the weirdest feeling, like you're driving over water. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, well, this woman was driving on that, in, a, in her little Yugo, and she got right in the wind, whoop, and she went right over. Yep, she died. Only one. <laughs> Okay, so what's hard to understand? Well, two millennia, I already told you, laws, they're the commons. It rightfully belongs to us, <laughs> right? It's private use, not ownership. We've talked about that. It's held in trust, talked to you about that. Um, you know, this, this is the United, this is the end, by the way, we're coming up on. The United Watershed of America. These are all the little watersheds. So if you look at it that way, right, instead of just, you know, isolated states, there's the real one, right? Uh, some of those little purple lines you see, I stole this from Canada. That was some of their planned redistribution that didn't happen. <laughs> okay, that's the, the water. Here's that spot I was telling you. Look how narrow that is. One little blip and those carp are going to be here. So why did I care? I care a lot. These are my pictures. This is Lake Superior Beach. You guys got to come so you can walk along there. It's my picture of my trout, right? The brook trout, that's a native trout. Um, no, I'm not Benjamin Franklin, <laughs> but I like it. I like his quote, when the well is dry, we know the worth of water, right? When the well is dry, he was a smart guy. This is me fishing out on the Great Lakes. This is a waterfall and the lake goes into Lake Superior called Iron Horse Falls. Beautiful, you can hike, you camp. This is Lake Superior. That's where I brought my friend from uh, Wales. We got on the overlook and he was actually with me when I took this uh, log. They would roll the logs and then float them out. And he was looking, and there was a ship going by, and he says, that's fresh water? He just couldn't get over it, you know, the size. You no, know, you can't see Canada from there, so. Um, we love our water. We love, this is the mighty, mighty Mac over here, which we showed you. Look how pretty that is. Do we want that to go away? This is the Grand Hotel, one of the most famous hotels built in the 1800s. There are no horse, or no cars allowed on the island, only horses. So if you want to go there, that island sits right as you drive here, if you were to look over here, you would see Mackinac Island. Beautiful place to go. Very famous. British, French fought over it. We fought over it. And then, of course, what can we do about it? Those are my students on one of the Great Lakes. It's actually Lake Michigan, out in front of CMU Bio Station, doing some water sampling. And you can also, I have to have this, because I love this. The Uper Lights. You can take your family. This Lake Superior out there. That's what they look like, that's my hand. When you shine a um, black light, we call them, ultraviolet light on it, and it's soda light. Soda light reflects this, beautiful. They look just like a regular stone in, in daylight. And we all were collecting, and those are all, those are my hands, those are all the ones that I found. They're just, it's incredible. Just discovered in uh, 2017. So pretty cool, you can go hunting for Uper lights, which is awesome. And then last, you're not going to need to, to read all of this. I put this up here for those of you that are interested in more. Um, that website, and any of you that want this uh, slide deck, you know, let me know, <laughs> and I'll just send it to you um, because those are two good spots because they have real-time data from buoys. Like if you guys wanted to study it in your class, do a hydrobiology, do whatever, you can go in. It's awesome. You can to temperature and it's very interesting algal blooms and hypoxia the breakdown you know the oxygen deficiency um, hydrology you can look at benthic samples remote sensing GIS you guys know about that stuff physical properties like bathymetry that's the shapes and bottom and depth and all that all kinds of historical stuff this is a good one too about the Great Lakes and the Sulox um, the US Army Corps of Engineers and finally I told you I'd wrap up I'll just say thank you, a big thank you. Did I get that right? Does that mean a big thank you? <laughs> I hope, or something like that. To the Fulbrighter, of course, for getting me here, Mooney, right? The botany and zoology for you guys. But especially Michael and, and his wife, of course. But 
especially Michael, for putting up with me. And because he did, he gets a prize, a very valuable one. A sticker <laughs> that was free, but it says, the largest first water system on Earth, the Great Lakes. So you can stick this on his forehead or his car. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. I think there you go. On his car or wherever. Should I do it right now? Uh, if you want, you can take it around. Take it around, please. She's saying, don't do it, don't do it. And then you won't be able to re-stick it. I will put it in my door. Yes. Yeah, sure, but for a moment. <laughs> we should get a picture of that. The other thing, if you want, I only made 20 of them. I didn't want to kill trees, but this is the great... Oh, that stuff I was saying. I don't remember all that. He was going so fast. <laughs> there's the lab and everything, and there's contact. I made 20 of them. If you want to grab one, it's, it's kind of nice because it's a real good resource for you guys um, if you're interested. But I'll just say... Thank you again. I didn't know over. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. It's okay. Thank you very much for the nice talk and the speaker, obviously. It looks good. You're an actor. You know, it fits to my mask, I think. Yeah. And I should have got a mask. We have, we have some time for questions. You know, we can go deeper to some stuff. Well, why would we? Yeah, anything. Whatever. Ask me anything. I don't know. I'll yeah. make it up. Yeah. So, thank you very much for your speech. Um, I'm really glad you talked about Canada. Yes. <laughs> um, so you, you like summed up like many uh, horrifying information <laughs> about uh, water pollution. So uh, what is the current situation? Yeah, what's the good news? Yes, very good question. Because that's typical, and especially in my environmental classes, is like you're so depressing. You know, <laughs> it, I mean, you look at that, you go, oh, that's all really in reverse good news. All those, I should have been a little more positive on that, but those, the Great Lakes initiatives, all those things, and the chart with the, the dropping of the PCB and the phosphorus, there's, in those areas of concern, all are on a downward trend. So that's, you know, there is good news that the regulations um, are working <laughs> to a point. And so that's good. My biggest fear, usually, you know, kind of extrapolate out from your question, my biggest fear is more of the invasive species because that has accelerated and that one is really almost impossible to deal with. As you know, biologically, you know, all these other things, um, it's called biolog you know, environmental fate. What does this stuff do when it gets in the sediments? What does it do when it gets in you? You know, the contaminants, we can kind of do that. But once those invasives get in there and they kind of, take over, they're pretty much there. We, I, like I said, I, I'm not aware of them, of any being eliminated, the only one, two, that we can control. And that's good news, that's a positive story. The lamprey, we didn't get the time in that, decimated the lake trout population, the native trout. Literally, I mean, it's almost completely eliminated it from the Great Lakes because of one thing. They had no defense against the lamprey. So that was bad news, and the good news was we found a control, it's a lamprocyte, it's a chemical, but it's um, specific to the animal seats, which are the little baby when they're in the... Because they live in the river. If you don't know a lamprey, it swims upstream. just like a, a salmon would do. It spawns and dies. And so they get them when they emerge from the gravel, when they're babies, animal seats, and they, they, they kill them. <laughs> and it's very effective. It doesn't kill anything else. It doesn't... It's not... Uh, it degrades real fast in the environment. It's not toxic to anything. They've been using it forever. And so that's good news. You know, so there is... <laughs> There is hope. Well, my biggest thing is that it is is more ecosystem wide too. Remember what we said, looking at this from a big picture, than just me. Because before it was very very narrow. Especially the Native Americans were very just. I want to fish and leave me alone. You know, I I'll go whenever I want. And they finally got on board and they re renegotiated treaties from the 1800s. It took years to get them so that everybody's on the same. And the Canadians and the Americans feel the same way. That's a positive too. Are there any preventive measures when it comes to invasive species? Maybe Lots of them. <laughs> yes, all of the above. I mean, they try. It is illegal. She's asking if you didn't hear. Are there any preventative or is there anything? All of that is illegal. Remember the ballast water that I mentioned? That's illegal. You can't do it. But they they 
do it. And, and, and enforcement, boy, I'm glad you, I didn't even have time to get into that, but enforcement is the, there could be plenty of laws on the books. Like in the US, safety belt is a law, but if I decide I don't want to put a safety belt on, I can't do anything, right? I'm driving and if I decide to do it, I'll do it, but I can't enforce it. So that's what's happening. They pull people over, they try to enforce them. But the same with us, we have a low budget for enforcement. So that's a big, of any regulation, um, NPDES, that big permit, those are in violation a lot. That's what I used to do for a living for 10 years is I would go in and sample those outfalls if you saw with the mud, the pollution, and um, work with them to, to stop it. So there's lots of good development. There's a big one called the Brownfields Redevelopment, which is really cool, taking old polluted sites, like we have a lot here in Europe <laughs> that go way back, right, from the war or whatever. I worked on some project, I even worked on one in Serbia, that has a munitions dump and chemicals and all that, a lot of old, you know, nasty stuff. And in the United States, it's called the Brownfields Redevelopment. They get special money and tax incentives so that businesses go in and, and clean up the area and they don't have to pay tax, they get a tax break and they can bring workers in, because they're in the city usually, the brown fields are contaminated, rather than putting your plant out in a cornfield, you know, develop, redeveloping some agricultural land. Or so that's a big thing in our country right now, real big, and that's how. And then our, I'll plug myself, <laughs> why not? This consortium I was telling you about, it's brand new Saginaw Bay Monitoring Consortium between Delta, Saginaw Valley, the tribes. I live right next to the Saginaw Chippewa tribe. They're involved. So there's a lot going on right now, but it takes too much time. Like I said, if you noticed, <laughs> they're, they enact them and then 10 years later, 1972, the EPA was developed. They didn't start enforcing until like 1978, <laughs> right? So you can have all the rules on the book, but if you're not gonna enforce them, I think I've seen an increase in that. There's more awareness now. Um, seems to be a push. Nobody asked me about climate change. That's usually, we're actually not being as, as effective. We're kind of moderated by our, where we live um, in the Great Lakes. For a while they were saying a few years, oh, we're gonna dry up, it's climate change, because they were real low, record low. Record highs now, we're having, the lakes always do that. I talked to my job, they've been doing it forever. They go up and down. That has an influence, you know, the climate. So we're looking at a lot of things, but fortunately it's more, it's more up here in the, the discussion rather than, oh yeah, that environmental thing. You know, I'll do, they check a box, I did this, now they're doing more. So. Any other, you're blown away? <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, I watched a video uh, recently, which uh, which was about uh, uh, about in a system of canals mm -hmm. that they are using some electrical devices for or against uh, against invasive species of fish. I have two questions: Is that for the carp? And the second, does it work? Boy, if you didn't hear him, that is an awesome question. <laughs> he said, I, "I saw something about they use electricity, some type of electricity to stop." fish from entering these canals and he, one question was was that for the carp and the second does it work and yes <laughs> to both of them that is to be used for carp they also use it on lamprey mm -hmm. um, and other uh, things that have to come up and, and migrate and that's what they do to spawn um, but yes it is effective actually they have to be very careful with it um, so that it doesn't the rule is in water because I use a lot of electroshocking when I collect fish the, harder, the bigger you are, the harder you fall. If you have a large surface area, you'll get really zapped. And if you're a little lamprey, you might get right on by. So that, but carp, it's very effective, or has been, but they found, because they have them in a series, because they found when they had one, if it's kind of like the dog one, I don't know if you guys have them, I have one for my dog, it's an electric fence. You can bury it, it zaps them a little bit, keeps them in the air, do they have that here? Yeah, it's a, it works really well. It trains it, but you can't have it they'll run really fast and go through it, right? And that's what happens with some of the fish. So they put them in a series, and it, it has, to this point, as far as we know, blocked them. So that's an excellent question. Yeah, they, they're using really unique stuff. We obviously don't have time to get in. They're, they're sterilizing the male uh, lamprey. 
uh, you know, radiologically <laughs> sterilizing them and releasing them so they spawn obviously with them yet no reproduction. I mean, it's a battle. It's a war. They, they use chemicals. They use electricity. Um, you know, barriers that are with fish ladders. And with my job was to collect them and do a, a ratio, sex ratio. And the females are the big ones. And they're literally because they're going to die. They absorb all kind of uh, you know mayfly. They don't have any. <laughs> they're ready to spawn and die, right? So they don't have any digestive. They don't. They absorb all that. So do the lamprey. Great big, and you'll cut them open. And it'll be full of milt if it's a male, uh, call it milt, the sperm, and then the roll, the eggs in the female. Literally, that's all that's there because they're just they swim upstream, they spawn and die, right? So they don't need to eat. So, that, and by the way, there are many. If you're wondering, are there are there lampreys that are native and there's um, um, parasites? No, we have native five of them, but they're not parasitic. They live in the streams, filter feeders. But um, the the spawning capacity of them is huge, massive, and it, remember the sucker. That thing is amazing. You wonder how do they get past like a dam or whatever? They stick to it. Because if you have a, a tub full, because I've done this, full of lamprey, we collect them out of traps. They're like a minnow trap. They swim in, they can't swim out, we pull them up on the dam, and we, and we count them. Male to seat female ratio can kill them. You know, we don't want them to go back in. But put them in these big tubs, we come back a couple hours, and it's zero lamprey. They stick to the side. Take their tail, flip it over, flop, wiggle down, go in the water. That's how they get over dams. They're very, very adaptive. I hate them. <laughs> <laughs> and people always ask, do people eat them? Yes, some people do. But apparently somewhere here in Europe. Not that I don't know. No, they're not an eel. Good question. Are there any examples or how many species got extinct because of oh. pollution or invasion? So do you have an example of native species? Yes. That went extinct? Yes, due to, due to us, basically, yes, and the invasive species. There are several darters, but the main one everyone knows is the grayling, the Arctic grayling. By my cabin, it's it's a town called Grayling. I mean, they were native, beautiful. Oh, I should have had Granted, it has a big sail fin. They're native to Alaska as well and Montana. A um, couple of us, but we had a, and we, two reasons. Invasive species that we brought in, blame the Germans. <laughs> Sorry, but German brown, the brown trout, Tamil trout. We brought those in recreationally, and they're very, very hardy compared to our brook trout, which you saw a picture of, and the Arctic grey. Really. They outcompeted, but the major problem with them was lumbering. Remember, we cut the trees down? Sediments got into the, the streams and basically made it like a hard pan. You know, I mean, literally filled in all the spawning area. And the oxygen went down, turbidity, the temperature went up because there were no big pines, riparian shade, all that stuff. Yeah, it, they're extinct. Um, there's some uh, of the minnow family and then plants. I know that almost, uh, no, yeah, the doom thistle, I think, that one's almost. Extinct due to the, um, it's not the purple lucid, right, but it's another plant they can't deal with. So, yes, they've documented those. They're, the biggest fear is the carp, though, because they, they know those are really good at what they do. Um, no one's really sure. Everyone usually says, well, why don't you eat them? You know, <laughs> well, maybe we can. I don't know. Because they're not the same, as they're, they're not Cyprinus carpio, you know, the ones you guys think. It's, uh, um, I can't remember them all. It's the big head, the silver, the Asian. Here yeah, for Christmas. Christmas. There you go. Christmas. Yes, there's an idea. We'll, we'll save our ponds. Save our ponds. So it's in the best shape because of the carp production. Isn't that funny? They because uh, Mikel was telling me they brought them in the carp ours. They brought in to to solve their ponds to clean clean them up. And all they did was destroy. Every, I mean, they eat, eat it. If you know, they the bottom. They have the little burrows and feed off the bottom. And they'll eat everything. Made, made it into a, just a mud puddle, basically. It's a bad, bad move. That happened a lot. There, there's species of the, the um, smelt, <laughs> smelt, was brought in. Salmon, most people, people, young people, they all think, oh, those are native. No. We had Atlantic salmon, not Chinook and coals. Those are 
not needed. We're brought in for sport. Um, pheasants, you know, from, from China, so not an aquatic species. But we brought in a lot of stuff and didn't realize what we were doing. Many of them didn't succeed, they died, obviously. But yes, we've had we've documented a few that have been eliminated. We almost got our entire population of lake trout eliminated by the lamp. They, they came close. There's only a few reproducing populations, one in a big shoal in Lake Superior and one in, in Lake Huron for a, a lake system that was literally covered with lake trout, and now they're almost gone because of the land. Very susceptible, but they have very fine scales, if any. <laughs> they attach very easily. They're, they're slow swimmers. And didn't have any protection against the land. Didn't know what it was. It was big. Still is. Any other? Yes, uh, I would like to ask about the white pines. Mm -hmm. Because you said it, uh, it got wiped out about in nine. Yep, yeah, right around the teens. Uh, yeah. It started in the late 1800s. Yeah, and was it completely wiped out, no remnants, or uh, is there anything left, or recovering, or is it just clean? Excellent question. You have a lot of really good questions. There is one tiny, not one tree, but one <laughs> tiny little oasis, and it's in Grayling, of all places, where the, you know, the Arctic Grayling. It's called Hartwick. Hartwick, it's named the person Pines. And you can go there and see these ancient, what it would have looked like in, in Michigan, literally. I mean, the whole, the, like Saginaw, Bay City, those were all where I'm from, the Tri-Cities. That's I forgot to show you where Delta was, right in the middle of that, that middle of <laughs> Saginaw, Bay City triangle, the Delta, right there. Um, ball pine, white pine, huge, kind of a biological desert when you think about it. It was all pine needles and very acidic soil, not, not a lot of diversity, mm -hmm. right? But when they <laughs> cut everything down. But Hartwick was saved. We don't know why. There's a, and I actually have one that I'm pretty sure I aged it. It's, it's, it's an old ancient tree. It was probably about this big back then. It's 300 years old. Um, a few of them they didn't get that are around, but a patch, a little fruit, yeah, still there. And then one of the oldest trees in there just fell over last year. Um, you know, died of natural causes. But um, yeah, there is a little little patch that they didn't cut down. In my, where my cabin is, they're still there. If, if uh, Berka and Mikhail and I all got our hands like this, you know, and went around that stump, it's a pine stump, we wouldn't reach around it. It was that big. And the whole, you got to imagine that whole area looking like that. It just, it blows you away. It's so sad. I mean, it's like, oh, couldn't they save one tree? And are there any ongoing efforts for you know, repopulating some oh, yeah. area? Just... Oh, yes. <laughs> yep. Lots of plantings. And then during the Depression, we had um, the Civilian Conservation Corps, the CCC, and they went out and planted. But they did a lot what they did here in the Czech Republic and other European countries. What did they do? If you remember, it was like monoculture, and they planted them all in nice, neat little rows, and so you had all these little twigs. Yeah, they did the same thing. They used red pine instead mm -hmm. of white pine. And we had these. <laughs> There's nothing in them. They're literally just needles and these, you know. Yeah. So now they're doing a, a planned. Select a cut, and then they go in and replant. Yeah, there's reforestation, especially in the UP, the Upper Peninsula, the Upers. Yeah, that's really nice. that's a beautiful place to go because the trees are all coming back. <laughs> yeah, it's gorgeous. Because that really affected our water, as you can imagine. That the literally the soil where I that place is telling you with the stump by my cabin is sand. It's it's it got. Uh, vitrification, it literally turned to glass when the fires came because they cut the trees down and left the tops, caught on fire, and the soil was sterilized. So, sec if you guys are into succession, you know, secondary succession, it should have been way back. I mean, that was in the 1890s to around 1910 in that spot by my cabin, and it's still not recovered. I mean, it, it really decimated the ecology there <laughs> really, really bad. Yeah, and they were supposed to leave it, not to kill you with trivia, but the, the guy that owned it, it's called the, the, the Ward D, his name was David, David Ward, W-A-R-D, and it was bastardized, or D Ward, D-E-W-A-R-D, the D Ward track, covered where I am, all white pines, and he, when he died, he told his son, he was an ecology guy, and he said, I want you to save, you can have as many trees as you want, for 10 years, but after that you have to leave the rest. Because he knew he couldn't move them to the lumber because there was no space, rivers, and you can't, you know, but to get them or they'll 
put ice um, and use a horse and pull and he said, oh, there's no way that it is. You know what? That dirty bastard, that son, who wanted so much money that he cut down every tree and he moved, he paid and built a lumber mill right there. So he could get, yeah, and, and every tree, every last one, except a couple, like I told you, by my house that are 300 years old, cut them all down. His dad didn't want it, but he wanted the money. So pretty much that's, I have no idea, I really don't, why the park park <coughs> survived, but it did. Go see it. It's really cool. It's actually a lumbering museum, and they, you know, you could, you guys that know about counting rings on trees, they have a massive, as big as this, cut out slab of a white pine, and then they have little pins in there, like uh, Civil War, you know, 1865, and it's really cool. And you could see, as you know, age it, right? This was a really good year, you know, it grew, you know, it's really educational, so they kind of turned that into a mecca. People go there just to see what it might have been like. All those years ago. Any others? I said good questions. It's a great place to go, as you can see. I'm kind of proud of her. I also have one more question. Oh, so, great lakes are a system. Mm -hmm. uh, and but I believe that each, as you, you mentioned, that yes. Lake Erie is more shallow, yep. cold, uh, cooler, not cooler, warmer. Warmer, yep. Uh, so, I believe these lakes do have some specific. You are correct. But are, uh, uh, when it comes to invasive species or the problems, mm -hmm. um, is some of the lakes more susceptible? Or if there is a problem, yep. sooner or later will be a problem in each of the lakes? Very good question. It, again, it would be an environmental one where I'd say it depends, because it does depend on the species right, and what it's doing. Like in Lake Superior, they got the hardest hit because they had the high, they're oligotrophic, clear, what they had the most lake trout. So they got hit. Lake Erie really didn't get hit that bad, although they will predate on walleye, these different species of fish. And what you described is really good. It was an excellent question, and you didn't hear about the different lakes. And they are, they're, they're separate. You know, they have like, distinct characteristics, each one. But they are literally all connected and they all fall and that kind of thing. But um, it does depend on what the critter is, like that little spiny water flea. He does way better and it's a little bit warmer. And then there's a new one, I forgot the name of it, a spider or something, crustacean, and that one does better in different conditions. So you might see massive, you know, depletion in Lake Erie and nothing in Lake Huron. So you're, you're exactly right, yeah. It, some of them are just, you know, system-wide, and other, some it takes some time for them to spread to, they'll ride on a ship or, you know, whatever. Um, so yeah, excellent, excellent part. It can really be variable. By what, what lives there already? And what the, the organism is that comes in? Excellent, excellent question. Yeah, it's as you can tell, it's very complex. It's it, all these people involved, and then you've got all the interest groups and money. When money gets involved in politics, and then there's the science, and the science is very, very difficult, as you can imagine. The, it's very complex, and each one has their own Erie is a mess, but it's really improved. You were asking for improvements. Erie used to be that there was literally a joke about it. I mean, it just it was so dead. It was so eutrophied. There was any. It had more hypoxic zones than it had oxygen. Um, and you know the cycle. Algae, so much algae, right? And then, so you don't have the emergent. We kill off all the algae too much, and it goes to the bottom, and then the bacteria and the respiration, and it goes to zero oxygen, and then you get clear water all the way around, and then all of the emergent plants come up. And yeah, it's just a big vicious cycle. So they went through that, but since the nutrient loads have gone down and all that, the green you saw, yeah, Lake Erie is a wonderful fishery for very diverse, as you know, you could have more critters there of different kinds. Um, walleye fishing is probably some of the best in the world right now, and it used to be, couldn't find a fish <laughs> right in there. So, so yeah. they no, nope, they didn't reintroduce them. This was from the reducing the phosphorus load, so that the um, and others, but um, and outfalls just literally stopped dumping, you know, into the lakes. Water cleared up, and the resident population very, very good. And they're good eating too. They don't have a lot of. Uh, there's a lot of warnings about mercury, and you saw some of the PC, PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls. They're related to the dioxins. They're very they hang, they're called conagers, you chemistries, people out there, they belong to a family, a group, and they all kind of are similar in what they do. And those have all gone down too, you're asking about, even heavy metals like mercury and others, those have dropped. 
Because those are warnings for eating fish. We literally have, if you're, if you're pregnant or you're planning on being pregnant, they have warning for, for literally females and then young people. Um, how to reduce the load, like trim the fat, how to cook it. Um, there's a lot more knowledge now. Because fish is really good for you, as you know. Right? It's not chock full of chemicals. It's very good. Protein source. I love it. I love catching them. You guys have a lot of the similar things that we have. You just don't have those giant, you know, reservoir is a unique thing. We have those too. You know, my, our thumb, we don't have a single, you know, here's this beautiful great lake that I live by. I don't have a single natural lake. It's, it's all reservoir. Damned up. It's a little strange. But over on the other side of the um, lake's everywhere. We have a lot of diverse geology. We have the karst topography. We have granite, solid granite, sugar sand, pure sand over on the west side. Glacial till, moraines. That's why you can't just say, oh, we'll do this. That doesn't work uh, all over, right, in the state. Very complex. The last one. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned also the problem with the native mussels. Mm -hmm. Most of them were wiped out or reduced because of the zebras. Mm -hmm. They cover, block, you know, the food. Was the problem of mainly in running waters, but or also in the in the lakes? Really good question. Yeah, he if you couldn't hear in the back. He was asking about remember the native mussels because we we had a lot of problems with them in Michigan. A lot of them got away. You were asking about those, and one of the big ones was the zebra mussels and quagga mussels that literally attach. Remember I told you about that, and they out compete them. They're like grab the food before they can get it, right? And starve them to death. Um, and he asks, is it in the running waters mostly or in the standing, you know, lenthic lodic, which is it? It's both. Um, seems to be a bigger problem in the inland lakes, lakes and ponds. That's where we saw massive die-offs. They do really well in rough water though, like the on islands and Beaver Islands, um, High Island, which is by Beaver Island, they decimated the, the mussel pond everything else. It was, a, it was in the shoreline, and um, what else did they do? That was the one that, oh, pipe the bird, but piping clover. Piping clover. Their nesting habitat was, basically it was just all shells, and where they were building their nests along the, the shoreline, they usually just gravel and some of them didn't work out. So they, they're an endangered species. Even the muscles had an effect on them. Yeah. Yeah. That's a huge diversity is for the other people information. The con con contrasting diversity in freshwater mussels between North America and Eurasia, like in North America was four or five hundred species. Mm -hmm. Here we have plenty, mm -hmm. barely. Yep. So they belong to the same basically evolutionary group. So that's one of the striking differences in bi the biodiversity in some groups some reason evolved in North America and not so much here. I so that's the big issue of, of the event. More potential to lose biodiversity than here. So we are also losing with, you know, if you lose 20% here, there's mm -hmm. two species yeah. in the US. Uh, yes, tens, yes. So. He's, he's exactly right, because we have, I mean, it's been, you know, I'm not an expert on, on the mussels, but those were one of the ones that were really impacted by it's direct competition. You can't imagine the volume of these little guys. They're really small. They're like your thumb and nail. And they, there's so many of them. You know, if you know that they have like a little bristle thread, they attach to things and they water intake, for instance. The, the pipe. Imagine a pipe a big around with our water that, that goes to all of Saginaw. It's literally completely covered up with zebra mussels. The water won't even flow. And someone asked, elect, electronic, electric, they, use, they zap them, they try everything, bleaching, you know, chemicals, and track, because they literally encase, you know, if you, if you can imagine, and walking on that beach I was telling you about, there are no stones or no, it's all zebra mussel shells, and you'll cut your feet, and, you know, it's that many. I mean, it's just, blows you away, you know, and every, some of the non biologists go, oh, look, isn't it great? The water's clear. You know, because they filter, they do, they, and it, but then you know about photos all and that goes, oh, all right, you know, it's bad too, <laughs> you know, so, and then of course our natives, yeah, it's 
It's not good. <laughs> Luckily, stuff are eating them now, though. Like I said before, nothing would touch them. They didn't know what they were, but I, I've been seeing some papers on ducks and none of the other started to eat them. So, yes, he's exactly right. We have more. We more. Actually, we have more in the macro invertebrates too. I think. And, uh, some of the stream ones. Okay. All right. Time's up. All right. So thank well, you very much again. Thanks again. Thank